Hello and welcome. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight for a conversation with artists Nils Norman, Fritz Haig, and Julieta Gonzalez, the artistic director of the Museo Humex. Uh, this is a second of our semester series here and the ongoing series of the Rouse Visiting Artist Lecture Series, which last brought us last month, um, the production designer Hannah Beekler and cinema scholar Jacqueline Stewart. And in November, we'll also have uh, Hans Ulrich Oberst here. And this is such an opportunity, honestly, for our community to be exposed to a plurality of voices and experiences. Um, we are very grateful, and I note that it's generously funded by the Rouse uh, Visiting Artist Fund. So before I introduce tonight's conversants and speakers, I also just want to note briefly that uh, there are a few other upcoming events in the next week. So next, or sorry, sorry, this Thursday, we will have the annual Frederick Law Olmsted Lecture, which will feature uh, faculty emeritus Michael Van Valkenburg. Um, and the next day, we will have a one-day symposium, How to See Architecture, Bruno Zevi, um, which will feature a keynote by John Louis Cohen. So we are honored, and I am personally quite excited to be here tonight with Niels Norman, Fritz Haig, and Julieta Gonzalez. Um, they are here to discuss their recent project, Proposals for a Plaza, at the Museo Humex in Mexico City. The project was commissioned as part of a series, Agora Blueprints for Utopia, and is a temporary sculptural installation inviting the public to imagine and participate in an alternative vision for the museum's plaza. So, Importantly here, to plug a GSD alumni, the work is guided by the principles laid out in the 1977 book, A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander. And basically, Alexander provides in this book 253 patterns as a, a kind of field guide in the creation of more humane public spaces. So 17 of these patterns, Fritz and Nils chose for this project. And for me, honestly, one of the most pleasing and perhaps telling details of this project is the inclusion of local dog walkers as one of the constituencies accounted for and really listed prominently on the website, which is very touching, <laughs> in the planning of events hosted in this plaza. This detail, right, playful, mundane, subversive perhaps, is not surprising, however, when we think about the backgrounds of tonight's speakers. So a, a little bit more about Fritz, Nils, and Julieta. So Fritz Haig's work has included animal architecture, crocheted rugs, domestic gatherings, edible gardens, educational environments, public dances, sculptural knitwear, temporary encampments, urban parades, wild landscapes, and occasionally buildings for people, as he describes. And these are just some of his very enviable project titles. Anyone who knows me, if any of my students are here, I love a good project title. So <laughs> Edible Estates, which was a series of domestic edible landscapes. Animal Estates, housing proposals for wildlife in urban communities. Domestic Integrities, which were large-scale gatherings created on crocheted rugs made out of material that would adapt, clothing and textiles locally found. And a kind of more loosely titled or described commune slash farm slash homestead slash sanctuary school hybrid, or maybe slash is inappropriate there, dash, which is a long-term collaborative project housed in a 1970s commune purchased by Haig in 2014. He has produced and exhibited projects internationally at the Whitney, Biennial, the Walker Art Center, MoMA, Tate Modern, Hayward Gallery, San Francisco Museum of Art, et cetera, et cetera. So next, <coughs> artist Nils Norman, who is London-based and works across public art, architecture, and urban planning. His projects challenge notions of the function of public art and the efficacy of mainstream urban planning and large-scale regeneration. This is, work is informed by local politics and basically ideas of alternative economic, ecological systems and play. And this play part, I think, is, is really kind of crucial to hit upon. So Norman's work uh, merges utopian alternatives with current urban design to create humorous critique of public art and urban planning. Um, he exhibits, 
widely and generates projects and collaborations in museums and galleries all over the world. He's completed major public art projects, including pedestrian bridges, playgrounds, theater curtains, love the addition of the theater curtain, and has participated in various biennials worldwide and has developed commissions for Sculpture Center, Long Island City, London Underground, Tate Modern, Musea Humex, Creative Time, NYC, the list goes on, and has also developed a play strategy and designs for Mare's Side in Blackpool. Excuse me. <laughs> Um, he has also designed a new library for the Garrett Reedfield Academy in Amsterdam and created new theater curtains for a school and community in Bristol. His great titles include Taco de Neef, Edible Park, and An Architecture of Play, a Survey of London's Adventure Playgrounds. And lastly, of course, we have Julieta Gonzalez, who works at the intersection of anthropology, cybernetics, architecture, design, and the visual arts. More recently, she has developed research and exhibitions addressing decolonial aesthetics in Latin America. She is currently artistic director of the Museo Humex and has held curatorial positions at Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo, Museo Chameo, Mexico City, the Bronx Museum, Tate Modern, uh, the Museo de Bellas Artes de Caracas, and Museo Alejandro Otero, excuse my pronunciation, on all of the above. Julieta <laughs> has organized over 60 exhibitions internationally, and one of these ex exhibits was installed until recently just inside the doors from the plaza, entitled Memories of Underdevelopment, Art in the Decolonial Turn in Latin America from 1960 to 1985. And this show uh, examined the unraveling of the utopian promise of modernization. So I can't wait for this conversation. Please join me in welcoming Fritz, Nils, and Julieta. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you all at the Harvard Graduates uh, Center. Um, for the invitation, uh, especially to talk about this project, which has been a highlight of our program at the museum. So um, I will read because um, I prefer to do so when speaking in public. So these are um, extracts from a text I wrote um, on the project uh, for a publication that we will be launching later this week in Mexico City with Fritz and Nails. So proposals for a plaza articulating the in-between. I'll start with a quote from the Abbé Logier from 1765 from his Observation sur l'architecture. Uh, whoever knows how to design a park well will have no difficulty in tracing the plan for the building of a city according to its given area and situation. There must be squares, crossroads and streets. There must be regular regularity and fantasy, relationships and oppositions, and casual, unexpected elements that vary the scene. Great order in the details, confusion, uproar, and tumult in the whole. I think this um, a paragraph from 1765 from Logier's book quite aptly describes the project that Fritz and Nils have developed for the museum in the context of our program for the plaza called Agora, a blueprint for Utopia, which is an ongoing series of commissions by artists for the plaza at Museo Homex that explore social dynamics in the public sphere through participatory and performative strategies, as well as architectural interventions. Though sharing ground with prior projects, Proposals for a Plaza by Fritz Haig and Nils Norman is nonetheless the first actual architectural intervention in the museum's public space. The environment designed by Haig and Norman not only visually modifies the museum's iconic architecture, but also the succession of structures, urban furniture, and greenery placed within the habitually void space of the plaza significantly alter its very uses, inviting people to linger, stop, and engage with the different elements in their design. A project like this one, which specifically highlights architecture and design, is part of a research on the relation between art and the built environment proposed by the curatorial program through the museum's exhibitions, programs, and publications. Among the many references that inform Agora Blueprint for Utopia is an essay by Dan Graham on the city as a museum, where he elaborates on the revival of typology in postmodernist architecture, taking as a point of departure architectural historian Manfredo Tafuri's writings 
on the Enlightenment as a period of fundamental shifts in architecture, theory, and practice, such as the word to turn towards a naturalism that assured an ideological role to artistic activity an architectural one as well. Graham highlights Tafuri's ideas in regard to the advent of this new role for the artist and the architect during the 18th century, that of an ideologist of society, which he relates, relates to architect's desire to make of each building, building a blueprint for a better society, a utopia, hence the title of the series. Architecture's utopian aspirations, inextricably bound to this ideological task, have been extensively debated in the fields of architectural history and theory. And it is in this contested territory that the collaboration between Fertig and Nils Norman for the Museum's Plaza aims to summon a wider reflection, not only on the relation between architecture and utopia, but also within the broader framework of the built environment and the debates that took place place in the fields of architecture and urban planning in the second half of the 20th century. The design by Haig and Norman for the plaza essentially organizes the space in the form of a garden, a construct loaded with multiple meanings and that is emblematic of this naturalist turn uh, identified by Tafuri in his analysis of Logier. Both Haig and Norman have placed architecture, design, and the built environment at the center of their individual productions. And this collaboration merges their individual interests in utopia, ecology, systems, and forms of conviviality to connect to some of the defining discussions uh, that shaped architect architecture since the 1950s. Their choice of the patterns from the 1977 book, A Pattern Language, authored by Ale Christopher Alexander, Sari Shikawa, and Mari Silverstein of the Center for Environmental Structure at the University of California, Berkeley, conceptually situates the project within the framework of some of the debates on the built environment that shaped uh, 20th century architecture and urban planning, and still do so today. Uh, I will address today a couple of these that um, I explore in my text, which are the shift from the logic of space to a logic of place, and the hierarchy of human associations proposed by the members of Team 10 during the Siam Conference of 1953, and the techno-utopian orientations that shaped design thinking in the 1960s, which accompanied the, shape, the shift from ideology to a cybernetics-oriented organization of space and communities, notably laid out in the Universitas Symposium organized by architect Emilio Ambas at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1972. A hierarchy of human associations. It is possible to identify an affinity between the pattern language developed by Alexander and his peers, which placed the human being and experience at the corner of any undertaking in architecture and urban planning, um, the shift set to motion by Team 10 in the Siam conferences of 1953 and 1959. As these countered the functionalist and rationalist rhetoric of the Athens Charter and broke with the logic of space uh, to transition towards the effective dimension that governed the logic of place. Team 10 proposed an organic, humane approach where the living being was at the center of the architect's practice and ethical concerns. To make the quote, hierarchy of human associations, quote, unquote, the center of the new approach to architecture, as suggested by Allison and Peter Smithson, implied many things, among them that architecture and urban planning would contribute to create a stronger sense of community, strengthen the social fabric, recover the space of the street, restore humankind's pedestrian nature sequestered by the car, and, open quote, provide from house to city scale a bunch of real places for real people and real things, places that sustain instead of counteract the identity of their specific meaning." Close quote. The shift from space to place also opened up an avenue for the incorporation of other vocabularies and techniques, ancestral, vernacular, pre-technological, and from cultures that were far away in time and space from the modern developments of the West, a perspective that is shared by Haig and Norman and made evident by the sourcing of trees and volcanic rocks from specific regions in Mexico, such as Michoacán and Puebla, and the study of local playgrounds and parks that inform their design for the plaza. It is important to note in this context that Alexander participated in the Team 10 meeting in 1962, where he had a discussion with Aldo Van Eyck on the organic city tree analogy. 
This later served as the basis for Alexander's 1965 essay, A City is Not a Tree. While not entirely in agreement with Alexander's ideas about the city being a semi-lattice instead of a tree, Van Eyck proposed to replace the analogy with two separate autonomous, though, through though intersubjective identifications. Leaf is tree, tree is leaf, and house is city, city is house. This analogy between house and city is recurrent throughout the Team 10 primer and can be inscribed in the genealogy of architects and urban planners working under the paradigm of the of the rule and influenced by Alberti's Reedificatoria, a notable example of which was Ildefonso Cerdas, reorganization of the urban plan of the Ensanche in Barcelona in the mid 19th century. In fact, some of the patterns deployed by uh, Fritz and Nils for this project lend a domestic aura to the urban public space. Technology versus ideology. Um, I'm not counting the time, so I'm not sure if I'm okay or. The ideas advanced by Team 10 in the primer and other texts did not directly address the increasing impact of information technologies on society and the built environment. However, their vision of the city as a series of networks prefigures the technological system-based approach of the 1960s in which a pattern language is fully inscribed. The type of technologically oriented discourse that permeated design thinking, architecture, and urban planning during this period was characterized by the increasing sentiment that an ideological discussion was alien to the real needs of society and that it was necessary to bring the conversation closer to the objective world of science and towards an environmental vision that studied the behavior of the organism and its conditions for survival. In this sense, the symposium, uh, Universitas, titled Institutions for a Post-Technological Society, the Universitas Project, uh, organized by Ambassad MoMA in 72, gathered a group of architects, scientists, urban planners, sociologists, art historians, and economists. The interdisciplinary and system-based approach of the symposium reflected a growing awareness of the interrelation between the natural and man-made environment, the effects of technology on the natural and artificial realms, and the needs towards a problem-solving and ecological approach to design. The papers delivered in the symposium were varied and sometimes conflicting in their approaches, reflecting the multiplicity of viewpoints that could engage in a reflection in, on our man-made surroundings. Some of the papers brought a holistic and cybernetic perspective to the discussion that underline the importance of a total human experience and provided context for Christopher Alexander's interventions in the collective discussions that took place during the working sessions. These generated a substantial, substantial amount of controversy. And it was in the context of these deba debates in the symposium that Alexander advanced the research on the pattern language that he and his colleagues at Berkeley had been working on. Informed by the cybernetic theories of, of self-organization, feedback, and computer programming that circulated at the time, Alexander's pattern language approach enabled everyone, not just architects and planners, to shape their own environment. To prove the viability of his approach, he cited the fact that at the moment that they were, he and his colleagues were applying this experimental method to the design of the campus at the University of Oregon. There, the working method implemented by Alexander resonated with the ideas and human experience while being also deeply embedded in the countercultural spirit of the time. Alexander proposed to diagnose people's feelings and to use the results of these findings to plan future changes in the campus. To give people senses priority would allow the designers to take into account emotions, feelings, which in short, uh, approach the logic of place and affect that guided Teen Thames' rupture with the Athens chapter in the 1950s. Universitas, though largely inconclusive, opened up multiple avenues of inquiry that are still valid today. It also proposed new and, a new and active role for the museum in rethinking the built environment, one that the Home X Museum's program seeks to follow by inviting artists to conceive of projects that bring this set of issues to the table. In many ways, proposals for a plaza by Fritz Hagen and Nils Norman reflects the sentiment expressed by Haig in an essay he wrote for Art Forum in 2008, where he quoted Jane Fonda as saying, the, place, the best place to be radical is in the middle, as it is there that one finds those complicated intersections that cut across religions, religious, political, and geographical boundaries, and only by operating in 
that space of overlap do you start to have the multiple audiences necessary for a real conversation. In the sense, with this project, Hagen Norman initiate a conversation on social and ecological issues, as well as urban and architectural ones, from the territory of art and design, that in no way aims to offer ambitious solutions, but rather to generate an experience that fosters a reflection on the interconnection between the natural world and that of built things, and how humans operate within this dynamic. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Fritz, joined by Nils, and I thought to ground our conversation in some something beyond just uh, abstract conversation around a project none of you will probably be able to see firsthand, um, to start with the pattern, the 17 patterns Nils and I selected for the project, and then uh, to walk through just the plan so you could understand the layout. Um, I was first introduced to pattern language when I was in architecture school, and uh, as at the time, most architecture students were, I think. I don't know if that's the case anymore. And I remember at the time thinking it was the most boring, retrograde, conservative thing I could imagine, and I had no interest in it at all. And uh, I was interested in making cool-looking things. Uh, and, and there was nothing about pattern language that um, I found interesting, I remember at the time. And uh, now that I've kind of migrated my work uh, you know, radically since then in various directions. I've come back to pattern language as essentially my Bible in some way. I think it's it's a pretty phenomenal uh, book. It's just, it's even printed on Bible paper. If any of you have spent time with the book, it's it feels like the Bible. Um, so it was a helpful, guide for the project. Nils and I are um, coming to Mexico as foreigners who've spent very little time there from colonial countries. And there were a lot of discomforts I had in particular about doing a public project in a place uh, you know, coming from where we are. And uh, working with um, pattern language was a helpful way to bypass a lot of those issues, I think, and also We'll get into it, but the materials that we used. Um, but the patterns, the 17 patterns we selected were the ones that were most, um, we could see most needed in this plaza or most relevant to the plaza. If you're not familiar with pattern language, the 253 patterns move from the global big uh, general macro scale of the city in urban rural space down to the finest details of interior planning and the chairs you have around a table. Um, and I think it's important to consider the book as a, um, an attack on modernism and a complete reversal of a lot of what was happening with architecture and town planning in the 20th century that goes very much hand in hand with Jane Jacobs and Lawrence Halperin and both of the Halperins in Northern California who are other like important figures in my work. Um, so the context, I think, is really significant in the 70s in Berkeley. Um, and I think, I think part of what uh, pattern language does, which Julieta hinted at, it's a way of short-circuiting the, the top-down dictatorial megalomaniac model of the architect and putting design and placemaking back in the hands of the people. And, um, and this book is available to everyone as a way to um, plan their own, their own spaces. Um, anyway, the patterns we started with, the pattern, patterns go from big to small, so you'll be able to see that um, as we move through. The other thing I wanted to mention, if you're not familiar with the book, um, the patterns have asterisks. And it's called a pattern language. It's not the pattern language. And the idea is that it's a pattern that's in formation. Anyone could then take this, pat this book and add more patterns, change the patterns. This comes after a lot of research. And the idea is it's a fluid, fluid thing, which they acknowledge. So the asterisks refer to 
the degree of certainty that they have in the pattern. So if you see two asterisks, they are referred to as true invariants. The authors believe it is impossible to solve the problem without shaping the environment according to the pattern given. In these cases, the pattern describes a deep, inescapable property of well-formed environment. So they're absolutely sure. Uh, one asterisk means they believe they've made some progress to identifying an invariant, but improvement on the solution is possible. And it goes on and on. Patterns without asterisks, the authors are certain that they have not succeeded in defining a true invariant. And on the contrary, there are certainly different ways of solving the problem. So um, in the book acknowledges its incompleteness. And uh, we can talk about that too, which I think is interesting. Um, so we start with Carnival, um, which We'll get into how the book is, is organized, but um, Carnival just acknowledges the fact that it's important that public spaces have moments of celebration where people come together to mark time. Um, public squares is obvious. Um, pools and streams, we were interested in the patterns. We weren't able to fully implement the patterns at full scale, and we can almost think of it like the whole thing like a model. So having any amount of water in the space is gives us the pattern of of pools and streams, just the physical presence of it, even even if it isn't that big, um, that the dynamic quality of it is there. Um, public outdoor room, local sports, food stands. You'll see the stand that we created is like the ghost of a stand. A lot of these patterns are that we've implemented are like placeholders for these patterns. Um, uh, uh, sleeping in public, which I think is one of our favorites and maybe one of the most provocative ones and maybe one of the most successful ones, as we've heard from Julieta, who's reported back on how the, how the project's doing. So the way the book is laid out, it starts with references to the previous smaller pro uh, patterns. It has a declarative statement, which I always love how, how declarative they are. <laughs> Um, it is a mark of success in a park, public lobby, or a porch when people can come there and fall asleep. I mean, it's a very radical statement. And um, this is what any person who makes public space today goes great to great lengths to, uh, to inhibit. And if you follow Nils on uh, Instagram, Dismal Garden, you can see his global documentation of this. Nils is obsessed with ways that people create public spaces that inhibit people from using them the way they want to, like falling asleep. But this is one of our favorites. Um, and then the pa each pattern then describes how you might implement this pattern. Um, and then at the end, there's a statement about, about this implementation, keep the environment filled with ample benches, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Stair seats, this is another important one. You'll see the bleachers that we've included. Um, and something roughly in the middle. A space without a middle is quite likely to stay empty. Connection to the earth, which is really obvious. And of course, there are two asterisks. Tree places, the fire. And this is, a, this is, I mean, sometimes these declarative statements at the beginning of the patterns go on for half a page or a full page. And this one's just like five words or six words. There is no substitute for fire. I mean, it's just absolute. And uh, there's something so comforting about this book. If you are lost in your mind about a project of any scale, um, to have this book on your desk and be able to open it to declaration like this suddenly snaps you back into focus about universal truths of human humanity and humane space making. Um, and, uh, and you almost can work backwards from a lot of these, these patterns. Seat spots, sitting wall, and there fortunately was already a seating wall all the way around the plaza uh, that we could integrate. Canvas roofs. Raised flowers. I think canvas roofs are interesting. They acknowledge the, the, the porous outer layers of architecture that architects don't take seriously. Um, the less something gets concrete and permanent, the less architects tend to be interested in it. Plants, canvas, canopies, things like that. I don't know if that's true today in architecture school, but when I was at uh, that was certainly the case. And I think this acknowledgment of all of these non-fixed elements of architecture is significant. 
Um, Nils, you want to take over? Yeah. So um, my um, interest in this project and working together with Fritz was the opportunity. I'm really I'm fascinated by how space is produced and how, as a user of space, how I can be part of that process or a group or a group of people or a community of people that I'm working with, how can we actually um, produce a space other than just um, um, consuming a space that somebody else has given to us or has has, uh, has forced upon us, if you like. And that's when I'm teaching, that's what I try and develop is a, a, a notion of a critique of this type of, um, of the production of space. And this project really gave us the opportunity to actually look at this plaza, which you can see from the from the very first shots. It was it's a very um, uh, very stark, all marble, no shade space. And we um, Fritz and I walked around the space um, and looked at what was really happening in that space and what wasn't happening. And from that, we were able to start looking at the different patterns in order to define maybe how they would work. And what was nice about the pattern, what was good or interesting about the patterns was that it gave us, it kind of relieved us from our own sort of taste making in a way that we could then use the patterns as an algorithm to kind of solve certain decisions or decide things for us that we wouldn't have to we wouldn't have to sit around and think well that would be nice if we put a tree there or that could be red or it, the pat the patterns actually helped us get away from our uh, um, subjective kind of taste and actually you, you, we could use them as a kind of equation or an algorithm in which to answer some of those questions that we had about how to change the space and that made that actually became very helpful i thought in the way that the book works, um, because it gives you a set of patterns, and you just figure out how to use them, and then you adapt them. And um, as a designer, that's I, th I found that really helpful. Um, so if you see on the um, on this, um, let me see if there's a better drawing. Okay, so on this image, we have a lot of the spaces, a lot of the patterns actually. Um, they overlap with each other. You, it's, some of them, some th objects actually act as three or four patterns. And um, it's some, or some of them like, for example, this is the city, sitting structures. We've got some bleachers. And we put them, um, not looking at this museum, but looking at the museum across the road, which is this huge, um, strange um, silver toilet <laughs> with, that doesn't, doesn't have any windows. And it's the... Um, Tomaya, Tomaya Museum, Tomaya Museum, and um, we were we were thinking that that would actually be quite because uh, that's basically what people when they visit the plaza, they would just Instagram themselves with that with the toilet in the background as the view as the Instagrammable shot. So we thought we could make a kind of feature of that by having this bleacher there um, as a way to look at this view. Um, then this is um, a small room that we made um, using trees and um, planters, and then seats as well. Um, it was very the details of this were very important. How to look at by taking up the marble. Um, the marble in that space was quite extreme. I mean, it's, it covers every surface, and we thought what, one thing that we could do was actually just rip it up, take it out, and we. Um, it was very fragile, so it would break. And um, that left us with interesting corners where a jagged corner edges, which before it was just a grid of very tight um, cut marble. We, uh, then we used that, those, those edges, those details as a feature um, in the design. And uh, we, I think we realized quite quickly that that attention to detail was really important in terms of actually creating um, a space. Um, and particularly one that worked in a kind of um, in opposition to this one, to, the, to what it was originally that, that Chipperfield had um, designed. And we also were interested in the general context of this extreme corporate environment. Um, the whole area is a, is a um, 
is very different from, from most of Mexico City in that it's all, um, there's about three or four malls there, very um, North American style malls and, and glass architecture, like uh, skyscraper type architecture. So we were thinking, again, how could we create a space that was different to that? Um, and the, the patterns really helped us to, um, to kind of create this other type of space that worked in a dialogue, in a critical dialogue with this corporate environment around us. Um, this is the, um, the fire. These were chimeneas that we had um, designed the legs for. And uh, we, this is a, a kind of a fire space where, which is lit every, um, for different events. Um, um, <clears throat> when people come to, for concerts and so on, they, they light the chimeneas. And there's a sort of, there's a kind of um, a ritual to that as well. Um, this is the object in the middle, which is a tree. Um, so what we did, just to talk about a bit about the process, um, I went to, um, after we'd been on site to look at the, the plaza, I then went to Salmon Creek Farm to spend a week with Fritz to start thinking about the design and start drawing it up and so on. And after that, I came back to Mexico City and I went with a team from the museum to basically source um, like the perfect tree, the perfect rocks, the perfect plants and so on and went out on different trips um, looking for these different objects and you, in the, I don't, you might remember in the slideshow there were uh, shots of like forests and stuff and that, those are the locations that I went out to um, source these different, locate these different objects and then I, in the evenings I would then email the images back to Fritz and we would decide which ones would work and so on. Um, do you want to say a bit Fritz? Or? Um, then this is the food stand, um, which is based on um, the um, the therapist booth in in uh, Peanuts in Charlie Brown. It's actually the same shape as that as uh, Lucy's um, uh, therapy booth. Um, this is the canopy, of course, um, and underneath that, um, if we've got a. I think one one thing we were thinking a lot about too once the project came together was this feeling of uh, Nils described it like a dreamlike quality where we could imagine people wandering into the plaza and um, and having this there's nothing there's nothing like a sculpture in this plaza that overwhelms you with its um, um, spectacular sculptural qualities that is overwhelming you with its visual or physical presence or is giving you explicit clues of its sculptural qualities or its park-like or garden qualities. It's kind of a strange hybrid and uh, I think as it came together we were realizing it was important how this space provided an occasion for entering a sort of dreamlike space where things were all a little bit off and or not off like there's there's mystery hopefully it's some mystery there and i think a lot of that mystery is provided by executing the patterns it's saying okay we need water so there's water and just the physical presence of water is enough to provide this 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 sense that water gives to a space that nothing else can give it's a very small reflecting pool, um, but um, I don't know if there's pictures here. As we advance, like children started throwing coins into it within the first hour of the robes coming down. Um, uh, the presence of the fire is very small and modest, but there is fire, and the phys there's just the presence of any fire at all is enough to to provide the 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 energy that that the pattern. Is, uh, is asking for. Um, no, another thing that we kept coming back to was that this was designed as a sculpture plaza. So uh, originally the idea was that things would be plopped on the plaza um, uh, without any real relationship to its surroundings in a very traditional kind of modernist sense. 
and we always came back to that idea. So in a way, we, we thought about the different patterns and the way they were, were physically manifested as almost sculptures. And I think that kind of gave them their strangeness as well, because they weren't really identifiable as sculptures, but we kind of gave them the aura of a sculpture um, in the way that we um, placed them in the plaza. And also, um, we, um, we thought that um, this idea, this sculptural element was important in that it was still an artwork and it was kind of, the idea was more like it was a sort of demonstration garden or, or some kind of, because it's a, it's a temporary, it's a temporary um, installation, it's not there permanently, but um, it's, it has been prolonged um, in its um, in its duration, so it was form it was originally only meant to be up for a certain few mom number of months months, and they've extended its um, life. But we were interested in this kind of like Fritz was saying, this kind of strangeness, but also a sculptural quality, and also something that would work as well. So something that where people could find shade. There was no shade on that space, and we tried to make as much shade as we could, um, because otherwise it just becomes this very brutal space. Well, one, if I can use that for one other thing I wanted to point out while we're still looking at the images is something, well, maybe I have to go back. Um, there's an important part of the, the dynamic of how the public enters this space. Um, uh, this is the museum. So people coming through here are coming to see art. The public coming through here are taking a shortcut across the plaza to go from one side to the other, or are having their lunch, or are walking their dogs over here. So you have people coming to see art coming to the plaza this way, and you have people going about their daily lives taking a shortcut coming this way. And one thing I thought was interesting as soon as the ropes came down in the project was if anyone's read the Italo Calvino story about the city on the coast and people coming from, approaching the city from the water, saw the, the shape of the city representing the desert and the, the towers like the backs of camels. And the people approaching from the desert saw the city as the representation of the sea and the form of the city as sails on the water. So depending on where you're coming from, it colors your idea of what the place is. And I think it's the same here, thing here. People coming from the museum would see this as a sculpture and would experience it perhaps as a sculpture at a museum. Whereas the people coming here may have no context or or awareness whatsoever of this as a museum or as artists making a space, but something that they're experiencing in the public realm. Um, and I think, for me, I was interested in it performing both and not having to, we do not need to declare to the people coming here, like, you, are, you need to see this through the lens of an art project. Um, uh, and I think both of those audiences needed to be taken seriously and understood and like kind of worked within their own terms in a way. Um, but anything else, any last things to look at while we're, we have the lights down for slides, I think. There's some nice pictures of dogs and kids. It's important. And the sleeping spot. We were, we were told just earlier by Julieta that that sleeping spot has become a kind of a make-out space now. <laughs> Um, but maybe we can bring up the lights and uh, and uh, the slides. Maybe um, I should add, well, something that we were talking about earlier on was that this project, also as an art project within an art museum, raises a series of issues about the built environment and specifically about what is happening with urban planning in Mexico City and how they were saying, how they understood um, the modern urban planning of the city during the 1940s and 50s was totally different from that of today. In that area, you have actually three malls in, in the space of maybe 
one in front of the other one, and then another one a block away from the other two. So you're circled by floor by these malls, and the style of life that these developments uh, sell to you is actually you will live inside a mall, whereas. Uh, other boroughs of the city, such as Roma and uh, Condesa, and even Polanco, which is nearby, all have, in the middle of the streets, they have this park that actually you, you can go from Roma to Condesa and never leave a park. So I think it also brought to light the fact that in the past, this city had been conscious of uh, this idea of living humanely, of this hierarchy of human associations as well. And now under this um, speculative real estate development, which is really unfettered by any kind of regulation, uh, it just seems to disrespect everything. Uh, this human element is no longer there, with, and it might be disappearing or will disappear from other areas of the city. So I thought this project also was important in indicating these um, phenomena as well. Um, and for us, it's been interesting because we, as I said, we spent very little time there. We had previously spent very little time there, and we installed the project, and then it's been, I think, interesting for us to find out from Juliet and other people at the museum how it's actually been used, because you have these ideas. You know, the whole place was designed around human use and thinking about people and how they're going to experience it, and um, I think the project only really um, you know, you could argue, unlike a conventional sculpture, I don't know if this is fair to say, but a conventional sculpture where I don't know uh, how much data artists typically want to get back on their installations about what happened. Like, how did people react or respond or, you know? Like, you don't typically think of artists being that worried about finding out what happened. But in this case, um, you know, so much of the project was consumed with uh, you know, really thinking about um, how people will inhabit and uh, respond to it and use it. So um, it's been it's been interesting to find that out. And actually, on Friday, we'll all be back in Mexico City together for a program to release the publication that they've done with it and to have a conversation there and to to look at it and see how it's aged and. One of the things we knew very quickly was that um, we realized was that we it would be because we don't live there and we don't have a long term commitment to being there because of finances and so on. We um, we decided not to have any close participatory collaboration with um, groups of people. Um, we thought that that was actually the and I I do that a lot in my work. Um, but it really depends on the context and how that's going to, uh, the political context and the social context. And so we decided that it would make more sense to kind of create a sense of ownership to the, of the space to it, the people that use it daily, but also to groups who work very closely with kids and also the education department and for them to basically take up space and basically do whatever they wanted in it, um, or program whatever they wanted in it. So we didn't. We sort of stepped back from that because we knew that we, we, it would be um, probably just not particularly um, um, something that we were interested in, but also not the way that we work to actually do it from a long distance, which is also extremely. I, I find um, in these types of socially engaged practice type projects is that when an artist is kind of parachuted in and develops a program and then is taken out of the equation, I always find that um, is kind of a problematic thing. And I, I hope, I, hopefully we try to deal with that in a, in a way that kind of worked for, and worked for me at least, but um, the way that, that that's developed. And if, I th it seems to have worked as well in terms of the patterns really did function in the way that they were kind of, uh, like it said on the tin, I mean, they did actually um, function really well, which was, I was actually quite surprised about, because I was, in the beginning, I was a little bit kind of, um, not cynical, but I was a little bit wary of some of the um, ideas and how, like, if you were to make the space, does do people really then use that space in the way that it's described um, in the book? 
and it, they did. And that was quite a surprise when, I, when that started to happen, almost as soon as we took the barriers down. The, 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 the patterns were used um, as, they should have been, as they should be. I, and I think one, as I've thought about, um, like with some distance from the project now, having installed it and having a few months of it up and knowing we're going to go back to it, I've, I think it's also helpful, for me at least, when you've done a project like this, to stand back from it and, and have some reckoning about what worked, what didn't, what, what, um, what do you take forward to your next projects. And for me, one thing I think now about, um, about pattern language, and I think this has a lot to do with the current political climate, is um, understanding what's changed from the 70s and from the late 60s that spawned pattern language and, and uh, the student protests in the late 60s. And, um, and I think I look at pattern language now and I see its holes and I see its, its blind spots in terms of its assumptions about who it's for and for the the society that is homogenous, that they're anticipating everyone to be the same. And I think this is the great failure of modernism, is that uh, it assumes this kind of sameness, uh, that everyone has the same needs, and that um, even though this book has this visionary utopic idea of like, we are going to create our own spaces that, that have some permanent universal truths about Humane space making, I think they're obviously, when you really look at the book carefully, I think you can see that there's a degree of homogeneity to the kind of culture that they're anticipating. Like, in particular, when we were, when I think, when you look at the patterns, there's no patterns for illicit behavior. There's no place to like smoke or do drugs or have sex or make out or even cuddle or, you know, whatever. Like, sleeping is this crazy as it gets. Um, but I think the patterns are, you know, you, when you, when you, you know, someone could perform pattern language in a way that was really oppressive and could just be a nightmare to live inside of, I think. Um, and I think, I think a great project would be for someone to take pattern language and continue it for today and for the world we're in now. And I, as, we're, as I was thinking about our conversation tonight and I'm thinking about this project now, uh, I'm thinking like, wow, it would be really exciting actually to, to, get, to get really deep and to start to think very critically about what did the 60s miss and what, what, did, what did the 60s miss that we're now living in the middle of? You know, how did things come, how did things swing back so thoroughly that it's almost erased everything, I mean, I don't know if that's fair to say, but it's like, how do you explain the moment that we're in globally? It's like, how do you even do that? And how do you, how do we look back to that period and pick up what was helpful, but also say like, well, what were the failures here? Because there obviously were for us to be where we are now. Um, and I think for me, uh, we can't move forward until we pick up the pieces of the people who tried to move forward before us. And I think um, to just sit on pattern language as a permanent Bible would be a mistake. And I think I'm interested in now of seeing where, where we could go after that. Um, I happen to have a few minutes in a crit here in this space right before a talk. And I was really inspired by the conversations that were happening in there. And, planning in Boston for, for communities here and anticipating the needs of the local communities in a way that I would, would have never heard in architecture school in the late 80s and early 90s when I was studying. And I think there's something changing. But um, uh, I, I, I don't know. It would be an interesting next project to, to think about, to think about that. I think because Nils and I are who we are, where we where where we were, like in Mexico, there was a degree of uh, trepidation about being too, you know, like, like I think it was a very, uh, it was a very respectful project, I, I think. I think we were trying to, it was trying to be gracious and trying to be like, um, 
You know, as much as we could be critical about the environment, the suburban environment that we were in, I think we were also like, or at least I was like, aware of the context and it, my ignorance of the context and just coming in with whatever I feel like I could um, be sure enough about, you know? And I think bringing in those bolt like boulders, logs, trees, pattern language, and then responding to that extreme modernist environment is like what we did, you know? It's like the limits of kind of how we engaged, really. Well, for me, um a lot of the projects I've done in the past is about looking at systems or ways of thinking or, or design patterns that were relevant in the 60s and 70s, and maybe possibly also the 50s, and revisiting those things and trying to resuscitate them, but within different conditions. So. Of course, the conditions are much different now from when something like uh, pattern language was written. And my interest is in testing those things out and seeing how they work with these changed conditions. And um, this, uh, this um, project really gave us the opportunity to do that in a, in a very large scale. And um, that was, for me, a very interesting kind of experiment in the way that, that was, we could actually test it out. And I've done similar things in the past with like permaculture and um, other forms, but um, this was the, the largest on the, the largest scale I've done it. And it was surprising to me how um, it still really kind of held up in a way, even though, like you were saying, there were these, there are, of course, these um, kind of um, uh, blind spots within it because it hasn't really adapted. It it's, hasn't, in, on some levels, it hasn't really adapted to. Um, the conditions that we live in now, but um, it, it still really had some kind of um, quite important qualities to them. And I think what, in terms of ideas around you know, place making or whatever terms you want to use in terms of urban planning um, or design, I think that there has been, things have been taken from pattern language, but it hasn't really been used in the way that it should have been or should be. It's actually just sort of um, um, kind of been um, taken apart, and maybe just the better, the best bits have been used. Or I mean, the, uh, my fear was that when we were walking around the mall, I was these different malls. I was thinking, God, what we're designing is just another reiteration of the mall in, in a way, because there were trees, there were rocks, and so on. But then maintaining this kind of strangeness, I think, helped. Um, helped us sort of and the, and our attention to detail but also not not wanting to just create a space that was purely to do with consumption in terms of shopping that i think was also important and i think the patterns really helped create that another type of space uh, that wasn't purely about um consuming yeah i think um I don't know. I mean, I'm interested in Julieta's perspective on that. Like, what have you noticed the difference of people coming in, like how they experience it um, from the museum versus from the general public? And like what their expectations are, what they think they're in? Like, do you think most people know that it's part of the museum? Some don't even give it a thought, uh, but they just feel free to use the space, which is something that I thought might not happen because of the problems we usually have with security, that they don't know how to behave with people and are usually very threatening towards the general public, even though we've been trying to work on that. And the people just come and use it. You put it there and they use it. And a lot of people don't even enter the museum because also we thought that might drive some more public into the, the exhibitions, and they don't, which is also a good thing, because that means um, this uh, project is actually filling some necessity that is there, and that people had noticed it was actually there, that need for these spaces of conviviality. I've seen groups of people like come and rehearse or have meetings there, like young students, as if it were a park. Um, I've seen, well, the sleeping corner, which is very much used. And it's funny because it's, it's like three by three meters. And um, you suddenly have a couple making out, 
someone reading who doesn't know the couple and someone else just sleeping. All three living in this very sleeping or lying in this very limited space and where everybody is like going around them because it's a, a transit area to, from the cafe to the entrance of the museum. So I find it very striking the way this particular pattern has become like the hub of action in the park and or in the project. And then also the other round uh, woven rug made of the plastics from the emergency, how do you call those? Um, yeah, that's yeah. That, um, that's a lot. That's used a lot by people for doing picnics, and then also the bleachers for eating there or just sitting and what people watching. Um, also, a lot of people lie on the rock where they can put the oh, yeah. um, the blanket and they just lie there and take the sun in. Even though it's been raining a lot in Mexico City these months, but it doesn't rain until four or six o'clock, so the rest of the day is sunny and a lot of people just lie there and read or sunbathe. I think you, sunbathe. you, you <laughs> mentioned the word conviviality and that for me is important, particularly from the perspective of someone like um, Ivan Illich yes. and his tools for conviviality. And I think that a lot of the spaces that I um, research and photograph, all conviviality and generosity has been removed from them. Um, and that's for financial reasons, for control and security reasons. But it just means we end up, particularly in London, with really incredibly bleak public spaces um, that don't really, haven't really be con been properly considered for how they're going to be used. Well, they have, but all within the sort of negative ideas. And I think pattern language actually is, are, they are, uh, the patterns are tools of conviviality. They, within Ivan Illich's ideas, I think they Absolutely. actually operate in that way. And to bring them back into kind of use, if you like, into operation, I think was um, really showed, like I said before, it actually showed that this idea of conviviality really works in a space. And I think the reason why this is so heavily used can be totally explained by pattern language. That a lot of, there's probably three or four patterns around this central notion of the way people engage with each other in a group. And um, uh, people are drawn to spaces that are enclosed on three sides with an opening towards a gathering area or a larger area so that people can be at once a part of a larger group but out of remove from it and still connected to it. You can be alone but not totally alone. You can be both a part of something visually, but removed from it physically. Like people find great comfort in that. People don't want to be totally isolated alone in a cell, nor do they really want to be in the center of that plaza. People want both. And I think this is something that I think a lot about in my work uh, um, in, in all ways, like that permanent balance that we all exist in between wanting independence and wanting to be uh, a part and solid, you know, some, some sense of self, um, but at the same time a part of something bigger. Um, and it's a constant balance that everyone is struggling for constantly in their entire lives. And I think this is a total example of that that we can see played out in architecture where we need to come together, we need a place to convene, but we also need to be alone. We cannot, there's the group, people are on the scale in terms of how social they are, but everyone struggles with that exact balance. And where I live at Salmon Creek Farm, these cabins are in the woods and we have a communal cabin at the top of the hill. It's precisely that, like we need to be alone and we need to be together, we need both and we need them in gradations at different times. And I think a pattern like this isn't just, you know, some funny thing. It's like a permanent universal truth of hum, human, human condition, you know? And when I saw uh, the first day when a small child came up here alone, like a 10-year-old, and just got under a blanket and laid down and took a nap while music was happening there, it was like, yeah. Like, you would have never done that in an alley around the corner, you know? Like, 
nor would he have ever done that in the middle of the plaza. Um, it was only that unique condition of being covered, being enclosed on three sides, having a comfortable material in the ground, that he felt all the cues were there, that this was OK. There was no other element but the design to give him that feeling. And to see that was a real validation, for me at least, of that one pattern. Like, it worked. Like, it worked within 30 minutes. And to know that there's a place for people to sleep like that and feel OK about it and feel safe. Because that's the other thing. Like, when you feel, when you sleep in public, you probably don't feel safe. You're letting your guard down. And um, I think for a small kid to do that alone, like, I was really taken by that. Um, but anyway, that, that, that aspect of the patterns that um, there is at least three or four patterns that address that, like seating nooks, window seats, um, you know, that feeling of both being a part of something and protected and never removed from it. But I, I wonder if, because I keep, I, I'm always thinking, would we have been able to do this in some other type of public space? And I keep thinking we probably wouldn't be able to because of the, just the nature of the museum and the way that now, contemporary museums, they actually have usually the most interesting public spaces around them because they have some kind of, they're controlled, there are events being held and so on. And they're just, um, people, are, people gravitate towards them. And I was wondering whether we could have actually done something like this in a, a more open space or a space that wasn't affiliated to an institution. Or I mean, of course, we wouldn't be allowed to do it. But I was just thinking that the conditions were as such at the museum that we kind of were able to do this one experiment. And maybe that's very hard, to, could be quite hard to reproduce. That would be my only questioning of it somehow. Well, I mean, having lived in LA for 15 years and having done pro like projects in cities all over the place, I know that a project like this in LA in most places would have been very difficult. Like, this is a very, very controlled environment. and. Um, I think were a resident of LA to do a project like this, there would just be landmines everywhere about all, all different aspects of public space today. And it's very complicated. You, you touch on all the third rails everywhere, <laughs> you know? Um, but this was a very controlled environment for us to do. It. And I think being outsiders provided us a lot of, provides you with a lot of, um, liberties because you're not aligned with any one locally. You can be, I don't know, probably you know, no one who experienced it would know where we're from or who we are or whatever necessarily coming in off the street. But um, I think it's something that would be, yeah, it would be hard to do just anywhere. Open it up to the audience. Yes. If anyone has a question or would like to contribute some thoughts. I'll start. Thank you for being here and for talking about the project. Um, where should I go? My question. Well, so first, maybe I'll do a sort of two-part question. Um, Fritz, you talked a lot about how this book was part of your own past in an educational sense and then that you came back to it later. Um, but maybe both of you could could mention a bit about um, if you had worked with it in such a direct or or indirect way on previous projects, um, and then now that you have done this very direct project, and you are seeking feedback about how it's going, and also observing things yourself when you'll be there this week, um, what might you then do in the future, are you interested in working with the book again? Would you incorporate feedback or observations that you've made now that you've done this project? Um, and yeah, how, how might that inform future projects? I, I think that, because um, as, as an artist, I'm not trained as an architect or an urban planner or a landscape architect. And, but as an artist, I'm able to develop projects that touch on all of those things. and. That, that's for me is kind of um, a very interesting place to inhabit. And I realize that with that, 
I can then maybe take ideas from pattern language and start looking at com commissions that I'm invited to do in other spaces. So like I was just saying, um, about the restrictions of this being, a mu the, the fact that it was allowed to happen because it was outside of a museum, it might be possible to actually then um, infiltrate these ideas into other commissions in other types of spaces, not necessarily with museums, because of that freedom I have as an artist. It might, maybe it's harder for a landscape architect to do that, a professional las landscape architect, or an architect, or an urban planner, um, but I've, because, it's, uh, because of these things being like artworks, it it's becomes much easier to sort of slip them in in a stealthy way. And that's why I find, that's how I find you can take this research into other realms within my art practice, um, other commissions and other collaborations and things. Um, well, I mean, part of the reason um, I think we used the book as it was just on, it was on my desk for a few years at Salmon Creek Farm where I live in Northern California as I was planning things there, planning projects and the, the, the design of the place and I had kind of rediscovered it. So I've been using it heavily there as I'm thinking about the place um, and the design of the place. And um, yeah, I mean it's, it's, it can, you know, it's, it's one of those, uh, for me, it's one of those books that is important because it provides you with the principles. And I'm more interested in the principles than in an explicit how-to, like a cookbook that would give you the principles as opposed to recipes is what I would be interested in. That's what this is. It's not a recipe book. There's just the principles, and with those principles, you feel the freedom to apply them. And once you know the principles, you can inhabit, you can, you know, inhabit them in a way, so I feel like they're, I've digested it a fair amount. And I don't have to, I wouldn't necessarily have to, you know, work explicitly, explicitly with the book in the future, but, um, but I, I think um, it's been, yeah, it's been a, it's been a pleasure to, to so explicitly use it, to say, let's try this out. Um, for this moment. It also helped, like I was saying earlier, it helped, it helped me to use it as a kind of algorithm that would then make decisions for us. So we didn't actually have to use too much of our own taste and we could use it as a way of making decisions. And that's what I liked about it. Um, and also, I, and I've, that's something I learned now in a, in a project I'm working on in Milton Keynes with a friend, an, another friend, Gareth Jones. We are using a color chart from Habitat, from the shop Habitat from the 1970s, and we're using it in the same algorithmic way. So whenever we have a problem, we say, let's look at the color chart and we'll make that color red because that works within this algorithm that we formed by only using three colors at only one time within the color chart. So it's kind of the way that we worked with pattern language. It's just, and that is something I learned using pattern language is that it's actually very helpful um, in a design, as a design methodology to actually have these kind of um, patterns or rules or, or principles. And um, that's something I would use in the future in other situations. Could I just have a quick follow up on that? Um, I was also intrigued by when you brought up algorithms before and I was thinking about how I, I like moments where an algorithm is applied when I'm using the internet, you know, let's say a friend announces that she's pregnant and so then I look up something about babies and then the algorithm thinks that I'm the pregnant one and my whole feed is just stuff, stuff about babies. So I'm wondering if thinking about a pattern language as, as an algorithm, were there moments where you thought you were applying the patterns for a specific type of uh, result or end, but actually you experience some sort of rupture with that expectation or um, or disruption to what what might have been proposed by the book and expected at that pattern. I don't know. I don't think. I don't. I don't think so. I think. Um, no, and I, you know, I think a lot of the patterns, they aren't performative. So the presence of water, the presence of fire, 
the stand, a lot of them them are atmospheric and they, there's no expectations around people doing certain things around them. The mere presence of those things provides something to the space. Um, so it's not like this one-to-one -one correlation like, like people are robots and you're programming them and turning on buttons or something. It's, it's uh, creating space that's conducive to certain feelings and experiences. And this is something that I feel strongly about in, in the place that I'm making now and building. How can you design and create an environment that encourages certain feelings and behaviors without having to tell people things? Like, um, you arrive here and you should feel welcome, but not so welcome that you can just come right in, for example. you know, Or a space where feel free to be yourself and to be comfortable and casual, but don't make a mess and put things away when you're done. You know, like a space can do that, I believe, if it's, if it's designed and, and used properly. And the place that I live now, that's what my, all my energies have been going into that 24-7 for the last four years, really, is, is figuring that out. And uh, I think that's what pattern language is, too. It's not, um, you're not programming space and programming people and... Uh, and a one-to-one -one relationship between we want this and we're going to do that, it's like uh, a little more complicated than that. Um, hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, my name is Kristen. Um, it's kind of related actually to the previous question, uh, but I was drawn to the idea that um, the of the declarations at the beginning of each pattern. And I wonder if you kind of treat the forms or designs in your sp space as um, as kinds of declarations that kind of subconsciously enforce the strength of the pattern. Um, and if you do, how do you balance those kind of declarations um, with politically or culturally specific patterns that are perhaps already present there? Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, you know, you can see just from the, the installation, we, you know, we had these patterns, but the, the actual physical materials we're working with are pretty uh, limited and pretty, uh, you know, some pictures there's like barely anything going on. I mean, you know, it's pretty minimal. Uh, so, I, I mean, I was interested in how little we could do to achieve the pattern, you, you know, like a boulder, where's a good picture, I don't know, like this boulder, it's too bad we don't have a person on it, but this boulder within, again, within minutes of, of, of it being open, we had a solitary guy sequentially one after the other sprawled on that <laughs> like man spreading <laughs> just like you know just like check me out i don't know like sunbathing but also just like you know it was it was great and it was just one guy after another after another and i took pictures of them <laughs> and it was almost like and you um did it too, right? I did it. I did it too. I took a, I took a nap there, um, but that that was an amazing one for me because it's literally just a boulder with a blanket on it, and it, it's a very precise boulder with a certain curve, placed in a certain way, in a certain orientation. It's not just any boulder. It was thoughtfully placed and selected. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a very declarative thing. This boulder that has a frame. Um, it has a blanket that's very colorful, so it's obvious invitation to come and sit there. And once you are there, you are on a pedestal and on display. And unlike the kid who's taking a nap back there, this is someone who for that moment feels comfortable occupying the center stage and saying like, here I am, check me out. Um, so I, you know, Part of this desire to short circuit the cultural complexities of being who we were doing a project there were the primitive nature of these elements, like the boulder with a blanket. Um, 
Uh, when we first had the invitation, my head was running to like, oh my god, I love Mexican textiles and ceramics, and maybe we can find local people to work with. It's like, oh, you know, so many problematic directions the project could have gone down, like, you know, with those kind of appropriations. But, you know, these are Mexican blankets we found at the market, but they're monochrome. There's no pattern, which is, there's a reason for that. Um, uh, so just, you know, this monochrome colorful blanket on a boulder, for me, strategically placed is kind of the essence of the project. This one, you know, little square of water, which kids were throwing coins in, you know, this one triangular canopy. The elements are very simple. Like, there's not a lot of, you know, you know, complicated design going on. It's more strategic and acupuncture-like in a way. Anyone else? Hi. Um, I had, you had mentioned at the beginning about uh, treating the pattern, uh, pattern language as a Bible, and then now a cookbook of principles, and it's becoming very much like a non-secular, cue for authority in a spatial place. And I think that's very interesting in talking about the how um, you have two groups intersecting and how the museum alludes to an audience that knows how to behave so you can have the faith that it'll go a certain way. And I guess, are there elements, I'd love to hear your thought for that, but also how certain elements were, did that best or became the most prim a primitive cue or a more authoritarian cue for one, authoritarian cue is not right, but in that way. Probably the bleachers would probably the most, um, well, I don't know, because then people were using the underneath bit and changing it and making camps and stuff, so it wasn't totally that simple. I mean, what I, what I found very quickly is that they, the patterns actually kind of blurred into each other. They didn't stay as like very defined things. Maybe the water, no, not even the water, because then the, wa the water was used in a, in a maybe a more ritualistic way with people throwing in coins and so on. So it was, there were, they kind of bled into each other. And um, I found that kind of, in a way, um, softened what you could see as more of a controlling idea around them as a, as a form, as a, as a set of principles. And that's what I liked about it. And also that blurring meant that people could kind of interpret them how they wanted to. And in fact, I'm sure most of the people that used them didn't care about the principles at all. They didn't probably didn't even read the thing on the wall, and but they still just used it in the way that they thought how they would like to use it. So, I think that that um, that was um, kind of in a, a way soften the kind of controlling aspect that one could see them being used as or for. Yeah, and I think just. Um yeah, it's interesting to think about the nature of these patterns is not disconnected. I think that's, to me, one of the most sophisticated part of the books. Like, um, if anyone's um, um, I don't know, familiar with the book and how it worked, I showed you a little bit. But at the beginning of each pattern, it refers to the previous patterns that are bigger. And then at the end, it refers to the smaller patterns showing that this is a network series of principles that are interrelated. You can't just take one pattern and remove it and put it in isolation. They exist in a networked system in connection with each other. And I think, um, uh, you know, that's hopefully, you know, people feel it in their bones when they enter the space that there's something, there's some energy at play, like uh, there's some charge in the space because of these, all these different patterns at work. That answers your question. <laughs> hey there. Um, 
want to thank you for coming and to say that I'm fascinated by your proposal for updating pattern language for our new time. Um, so I'm interested in seeing here how this project worked. Interested to hear a bit more about where you foresee this kind of work breaking down, um, what kind of spaces it won't work, um, and maybe if you could say a little bit about what you think of the word placemaking. It's become really popular now, and people are kind of throwing this um, word and this idea around various public plazas uh, all around the world. Um, and thinking about what the role of this kind of work is in relationship to architecture. Does this kind of work ever add up to capital A architecture? Or is it always going to be kind of relegated to lowercase a architecture? I mean, coming from an architecture background, what I've rebelled against most in architecture is this idea that a building is always the answer to a problem. And the more permanent it is, the more capital A architecture it is which I think is absolute rubbish. Like I think coming from an architecture background, I think there's, it's such a beautiful education in terms of awareness of the complex systems of human space making. And, and that doesn't always mean a permanent building. And I think diminishing the significance of things that aren't permanent buildings is a real failure of architecture today. Um, and not really acknowledging the significance of uh, things that change. Um, and I think that's what, what it really comes down to, which is architects don't want their work to change. And the people who use it need it to change. Um, and this is the thing that I've become most um, clear about where I live now. Where the cabins I live in were built without plywood or without disposable materials and with materials that you can disassemble and reassemble into something else. And we can take something apart and reconstitute it into something else pretty easily with the tools we have in hand or the materials at hand. Um, so I, I think the, for me the way forward in architecture is embracing change, embracing the fact that what we're creating for today is going to change tomorrow and to, to welcome that instead of being afraid of that and to fight against it. And I think when we talk about capital A architecture, I think oftentimes what we're really talking about is permanence and people wanting to see their work not affected by the people who are using it. Um, and I think this is a temporary installation in a very rarefied environment and it's not a fair it's not a fair like uh, performance of this you know, permanent value system, let's say, of, of what the project wants to achieve. And if, if you were to think about it, some like utopian plan for how we should all be living. But, but I do think um, you know, there are principles here that could be applied to permanent placemaking, yes. But I think the fact that it only exists for a year doesn't mean it's not architecture or has architectural qualities. And um, I don't know. I, have a lot, I could go on and on about that. I, have a lot, I think a lot about those kind of things. But One, one thing, um, talking to friends about this idea of placemaking, or just the term placemaking, and how, um, in a way, how kind of top-down that is, or how it sounds, or whether one could replace that term with something like genus loci or something, something more, a bit more poetic or more open to interpretation. And how, going back to this idea of conviviality, how spaces and maybe these spaces that you, or architecture with a small a, these are spaces that need to be really um, given much more importance. Things like playgrounds or spaces in between buildings. Um, those types of spaces where um, architects don't necessarily focus on. And those, for me, are the kind of the more important spaces. Um, and that's where, I, as an artist, that's where I focus most of my energy on. Um. We're going to have to end it there. Thank you. Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you so much.